The historic for Colombia candidate Gustavo Petro continues leading in both intentions for the presidential elections in May. In the framework of World Water Day, Latin American peoples ratified their demands against the deepening of extraction policies and the privatization of water. The Syrian city of Al Tal, north of Damascus, joined Tuesday the reconciliation process promoted by the national government to advance in the country's peace process. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from Hotel Two Studios in Havana, Cuba. We we'll begin with the news, and we do so in Colombia. The presidential candidate for the historic PAC, Gustavo Petro, leads the polls ahead of the presidential election scheduled for May 29th. Petro leads in the polls with 37%, which represents an increase of 10% compared to the numbers registered in January's 2022 polls. Federico Gutierrez, candidate for Team Colombia, runs second with 19% of electoral preference, an important jump since at the beginning of 2022 he counted with only 3% of voting intention. Empty voting occupies the third position with 16%, an indicator that gives candidates the opportunity to convince undecided voters. In an exclusive interview for our digital multi-platform, the Colombian Senator Ivan Cepeda stressed that the registry office's decision on the vote count is out of place. From a constitutional and legal point of view, but also from the point of view of electoral guarantees, this is nonsense for the following reason. The counting and scrutiny of the votes is finished or is finishing in these hours, which means that the ballot boxes containing the votes have been opened. The votes have been left at the municipal and departmental registrar's offices, and at the moment they do not have any chain of custody, meaning that they are under the supervision of people who we consider do not provide guarantees for this chain, which are people from the registrar's office who are close to the registrar and the party. So we see that this new recount that is being requested could lead to a huge drop. Cepeda also pointed out that if the people doubt the victory of a political party because they do not sympathize with the governing party, this could lead to a rupture in the country's political and democratic system. If the triumph of a political party is called into question because the governing party simply does not like it, obviously there is no democracy, and this can lead us to extremely serious scenarios. That is to say, what they're trying to do is that they either win or they stay in power where there is no triumph for anyone and what could happen is an institutional rupture. This is the dangerous path that the Colombian extreme right is taking today. In Brazil, at least six people were killed during a police operation in Rio de Janeiro favela. The events took place on Sunday in Chapadao, a group of favelas located in the northeastern area of Rio de Janeiro, where according to testimonies in the local press, agents broke into a party held in the middle of a square. Authorities informed that this police action was justified by the capture of gang members dedicated to stealing truck loads. The militarized Rio de Janeiro State Police said the operation concluded with four criminals in jail, six criminals dead, and six guns, a grenade, cars, and drugs confiscated. The president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, announced that he will send to Congress a bill guaranteeing free access to universities. President Castillo said, Monday, the government has finished and is ready to send to Congress the bill for free access to universities for young people who finish high school. The announcement took place during the inauguration ceremony of the school year, where he also remarked that next March 28th, 100% of school children will be returning to the classrooms after two years of virtual classes due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nothing and no one can turn the clock, the president said, stressing the fact that the return to face-to-face -to -face classes is the result of the work of three levels of government, as well as parents and teachers. Our children's education has to be a state policy, and in this framework, we believe it is important to tell you that the Ministry of Education and the Cabinet has this draft ready to go to Congress so that our children have finished secondary school and have the opportunity of free access to the country's universities. And in this framework, we're going to continue working day by day. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador inaugurated a new international airport for Mexico City. Felipe Ángeles International Airport, built at a military airbase north of the capital, began operating with a domestic Aeromexico flight bound for Villahermosa in López Obrador's home state 
of Tabasco. At his daily news conference, this time held at the new airport, the head of state said the airport was 100% complete and operational. The opening of this major infrastructure project comes as Mexicans prepare to vote on April 10th in a midterm recall referendum championed by the president on whether he should stay in office. So far, only three national airlines, Volaris, Viva Airbus, and Aeromexico, as well as Venezuela's Conviasa, have agreed to operate a limited number of mostly domestic flights from Felipe Angeles. Actually, it is a combination of skepticism and seeing a project come true. I'm among those who did not believe in this project, and I have to take my hat off and acknowledge it is a world-class facility. Very proud. I even feel like crying seeing this. It is something spectacular. It is a monumental work. It is immense, a monstrous work. And for the time it took to build it and the quality it has, well, it is precious. It is a pride to see that it is bringing us closer. It's offering above all to the families that live in the surrounding areas the power to progress, a lot of progress, a lot of work. In the framework of World Water Day, Latin American peoples ratified their demands against the worsening of extraction policies and the privatization of water. The Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador said a march will take place this Tuesday in defense of water and against mining companies that pollute rivers and lakes. Similarly, in Brazil, environmentalists are mobilizing against the annulment of regulations that protect the Amazon. At the same time, various social sectors are expected to mobilize in different cities in the region to demand that governments take measures to guarantee access to water in a timely manner. According to the UN Refugee Agency, more than 2 billion people live without access to water and at least half of the world's population faces severe water shortages. We are taking a short break now, but first, let's see a short clip on the consequences Latin America faces as a result of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Welcome back to From the South. The Russian Defense Ministry reported Tuesday that 137 military targets in Ukraine were destroyed by airstrikes on Monday. Defense spokesman Major General Igor Konashenkov said that they had destroyed six command posts and communication centers, two multiple rocket launchers, one anti-aircraft missile system, eight missile depots, artillery and ammunition, as well as 101 stockpiles of war material. The Russian Defense Ministry also reported that Russian anti-aircraft systems shot down 14 Ukrainian drones and they stressed that the military strikes are not directed against civilian facilities but are aimed at disabling the Ukrainian war infrastructure. Russia announced its withdrawal from negotiations with Japan over the Kuril Islands in response to what they called Japan's hostile attitude towards Moscow. Through a communique, the Russian Foreign Ministry explained that it is withdrawing from the negotiations to Tokyo's hostile actions by joining the West in their unilateral sanctions against Moscow, following Russia's special military operation to protect the Donbas population and to demilitarize and denazify the Ukraine. 
Moscow said that it will not continue the dialogue, unquote, due to the impossibility of dealing with the signing of a fundamental document on bilateral relations with a state that openly takes a hostile position and seeks to harm the interests of Russia. Following Monday's ruling by Moscow Tversky District Court of banning such social networks as Facebook and Instagram in Russia for quote unquote extremist activities, the Russian media regulator Roscom Dazor announced it will exclude Meta Platform's parent company of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp from its list of foreign companies conducting internet activities on Russian territory. The statement read Roscom Dazor will exclude Meta Platform from their list of foreign companies operating in the internet on the territory of the Russian Federation and Instagram and Facebook from the register of social networks. In addition, the authority noted that Russian media will not be able to display the logos of meta platforms nor of its social network Facebook and Instagram. Thus, the agency complies with a request by the Attorney General's office to protect Russians from further violations of their rights for meta platforms allowed on its social network calls for violence against Russian troops. Unions have called on security staff at eight German airports, including Frankfurt, to walk off their jobs on Tuesday in a pay dispute. The call by the Verdi Union set the stage for another round of disruption after walkouts at several airports last week. Verdi called private security staff out on strike at Frankfurt, Germany's busiest airport, as well as Berlin, Bremen, Hamburg, Hanover, Stuttgart, Dusseldorf, and Cologne, Bonn. Frankfurt, which operates Frankfurt Airport, said that no passengers due to start their journeys at the airport will be able to board there. The warning strikes came before a fifth round of talks between the union and employers set for Thursday. One euro is not asking too much. In today's environment, everything is getting more expensive. So we need that euro more so that our colleagues can feed their families and so we will keep on going. The employer's offers is not acceptable for us. We are worth more, so we are moving today so that the employers will move in the next negotiation round. The transporter strike in Spain has taken on a new dimension on its ninth day with the support of several large employers associations in view of what they consider the lack of delivery of the government promises. The Spanish executive had agreed with the National Road Transport Committee a 500 million euro aid as from April in order to subsidize the increase in fuel price. Several of the employers organizations in that committee have rejected the agreement and an increasing number of companies are already reducing or stopping their activities due to the short of supplies. The crisis comes at a time when companies are also also facing the rising cost of raw materials, electricity and fuels, as well as bottlenecks in global trade. China locked down an industrial city of 9 million people overnight and reported more than 4,000 COVID-19 cases on Tuesday as the nation's zero COVID strategy is confronted by an Omicron wave. Health authorities reported 4,770 new infections across the country, the bulk in the northeastern province of Jilin. As the city of Shenyang was ordered to lock down on Monday, the Asian giant has moved fast in recent weeks to snuff out viral clusters with a peak and mix of local lockdowns, mass testing and citywide closures. It reported two COVID-19 deaths on Saturday, the first in over a year. Last week, Chinese President Xi Jinping stressed the need to minimize the impact of the pandemic on the country's economy, but also urged officials to stick to the current zero-COVID approach. The tally is mainly made up of mild cases, which accounted for more than 98% of the cases of the Jilin province, and the medical treatment has gone well. The COVID-19 vaccination rate among elderly residents aged 60 and above is in jailing still has room to go higher, so we advise the unvaccinated elderly residents to get the jab as soon as possible. We will do our utmost to expand testing capacity and optimize nucleic acid testing arrangements while increasing disinfection frequency in key venues and sites and doing well in environmental disinfection and waste disposal. We will also strengthen the epidemiological investigation and speed up source tracing of the virus. More news coming up after a final short break, so don't go away.
Welcome back to From the South. The two, this Tuesday, the Syrian city of Altal near Damascus joined the reconciliation process promoted by the government. The initiative implemented by the Syrian government aims at normalizing the legal status of runaways and military fugitives, willing to voluntarily surrender to the authorities. According to a report by Arab news agency SANA, dozens of people went to the center on Tuesday morning to local time to lay down their weapons and integrate into civilian life. The report also says that the process has been successfully running for the last past three months in the town of Al Sabaka in Raqqa countryside. The Foreign Minister's Summit of the Islamic Cooperation Organization, a multilateral body that brings together 57 states from Asia, Africa and the Pacific, is starting in Pakistan. This 48th session of the Council opened on Tuesday in Islamabad, chaired by Pakistani Foreign Minister Shah Mahmoud Qureshi. The meeting discussed on finding a way forward to promote unity as well as economic and trade relations, the situation in Palestine and developments in the conflicts in Yemen, Libya, Sudan, Somalia, Syria and other regions. The summit agenda also includes numerous African issues such as the situation in Mali, the Sahel region and Lake Chad, Central Africa and the Republic of Kenya. The Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan spoke at the opening of the summit. The moment you say you are a moderate Muslim, you automatically say that there is some extreme form of Islam. Our head of state at the time of after 9-11, he coined a phrase called enlightened moderation. I understand English better than most, but I still don't know what it means. Enlightened moderation was a term to appease those who were relating terrorism to Islam. Also at the summit, the Chinese foreign minister expressed his nation's support for the Afghan people and the peace talks held between Russia and Ukraine. China respects the choice made by Afghan people, supports Afghanistan to build an inclusive government and govern steadily, open a new chapter of rebuilding peacefully. China supports Russia and Ukraine to continue peace talks that can reach ceasefire, stop the war and reach peace. We should prevent the humanitarian crisis from happening avoid the Ukraine crisis to extend and influence other countries and regions' rights and interests. No survivors have been found as rescuers on Tuesday searched the scattered wreckage of a plane carrying 132 people and nine crew members that crashed at the area on a wooden mountainside in the country's worst air disaster in more than a decade. The plane crashed near the city of Fusu while flying from Kunin in the southwestern province of Yunnan to the industrial center of Wansu along the east coast. State media said drones and a manual search is used to try to find the black boxes which hold the flight data and cockpit voice recorders essential to crash investigations. Soldiers joined rescue workers in combing the crash site and surrounding heavily dense vegetation. According to data from FlightRadar24.com, the plane was flying at nearly 9,000 meters when it entered a steep, fast dive and crashed. The Chinese Foreign Ministry expressed its condolences to the families of those killed in the crash of the China Eastern Airlines passenger jet and confirmed there were no foreign citizens on board the flight. According to preliminary verification, there were no foreign passengers on the crash China Eastern Airlines flight. Relevant Chinese authorities will follow up with further verification work based on relevant information. In the meantime, the country's foreign ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin also urged the United States to cast off its hypocritical mask of being the defender of human rights and face up to his own severe human rights violations at home. In the face of millions of souls of Native Americans who suffered genocide, the United States should sincerely repent for its own crimes instead of slandering and smearing others. In the face of the loss of nearly one million lives at home due to COVID-19, and over 40,000 victims of gun violence and tens of thousands of victims of racial discrimination every year, the United States should make deep reflection on its own human rights deficit instead of pointing fingers at human rights situations in other countries. In the face of 330,000 civilians killed and more than 26 million people becoming refugees in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and other countries in wars waged by the U.S., you should beg the, inf the international community for forgiveness instead of acting as a preacher of human rights. Japan's government alerted people of potential blackouts in the Tokyo region on Tuesday as power supplies were low after several coal-fired plants temporarily stopped generating electricity following last week's earthquake. 
While several thermal power plants damaged by the earthquake last week continue to be shut down, today in eastern Japan the sun does not generate electricity due to the bad weather. Since the temperature is also much lower than normal, the demand for electricity within the Tokyo Electric Power Company jurisdiction will be at an unusually high level for this period, and the supply and demand of electricity is expected to become extremely severe. Unfortunately, we are approaching a situation where we have to carry out a wide range of power outages to avoid blackouts. Sri Lanka deployed its army at state-run gas stations on Tuesday to ensure security after at least three people were killed amid an acute economic crisis in the country. At least three people have been killed in the past few days, one of them stabbed during long queues sparked by shortages and high gasoline prices. The country's army media director, Colonel Nalin Herath, said the deployment of the soldiers is a temporary measure. The current fuel shortage in the country has led to power cuts of up to seven hours. In this regard, the government signed an agreement with India in early February for an urgent 500 million U.S. dollar loan to address fuel shortages. Strong tornadoes hit in the United States in the last two days have reportedly caused several severe damage to infrastructures and injured several people in the states of Texas and Oklahoma. A series of tornadoes hit the region since Monday with the result of multiple damages to buildings and minor injuries in different locations. According to the NBC News Network, some 22 million people were threatened by the storm in Texas, Oklahoma and Louisiana. Texas Governor Greg Abbott said the devastating storms caused significant damage, but that the state would stand shoulder to shoulder with those affected and express gratitude that there were no reports of fatalities. We've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.